we're good. So how many of you feel a bit like this rabbit? If you look at the screens there now, I'm going to work through that. You're sitting there and you've got a bucket load of stuff in front of you that you've got to start considering and start doing something with. Next thing you've got with decisions, I reckon quite a few of you will be sitting there like this. And if you can't read it, I'll read it out. All of my decisions are wrong. So I've decided I'm going to stop making decisions. And then Garfield's there, yeah, good decision, mate. Whether we like it or not, we've got decisions that we've got to make. And there's one way of looking at this that uh, how do we make hard decisions easy? The reality is you can't make decisions go away. If you're in running multi-million dollar businesses, and most of you involved in agriculture are running multi-million dollar businesses, and on the back of that, you've actually got to make a lot of decisions. A lot of those decisions, as Stu mentioned there before, are worth a lot of coin. So let's be realistic from the start that it's not about you know, making the decisions easy or making the decisions go away. If you don't want to make decisions, don't own a business. It's as simple as that. If you don't want to make big decisions, don't own a business. If you do want to own a business, and if you do want to own a big business, then, by virtue of that, we need to accept the fact that we've got some big, valuable decisions that we need to make. Whether we like it or not, unfortunately, that's fact, isn't it? So what do we actually need to make good decisions? I'm going to start off this morning talking a bit about some of the psychology behind decision making. And then we're going to talk about the impact on that back to your businesses. I reckon the first thing that you need is confidence. You need to be a bit like this little rooster here. You've got to actually have some confidence behind it. Because if you don't have confidence, what happens with your decisions? Well, maybe, I don't know. I'm not sure. Should I? Should not? I'm not. Know. And you become really indecisive. What happens when you become indecisive? Start losing sleep. You start, your stress levels start to go up. Okay? You start to worry a lot more. You start to spend a lot of time doing the things that aren't actually going to make any difference because you become indecisive. So part of it is actually being confident about it. And I want to focus on some of the things that you probably need to have in place to work on to increase the degree of confidence that you can have with making a decision. And note I said it's about increasing the degree of confidence, not making you 100% confident. Because you work in an extremely volatile, variable, difficult industry, don't you? Think about all the things that you can't control. You can't control markets and you can't control rainfall and you can't control temperature. How big an impact do they have on the profitability of your business? A little bit? Big bit. Feel free to contribute. A little bit? Big bit. <laughs> Bloody big bit, isn't it? It has a huge impact on your businesses. And so, therefore, we need to think about what can we make a decision around that we can control that mitigates or minimises the impact that that bit we can't control might have. That's all we can do. So right now, and I want you to think about decision making. Right here, as of today, tomorrow, if you've got a decision to make, I'd like to think that none of you make a, de make a wrong decision at the point in time you make a decision. At that point in time when you make a decision, it's not a wrong decision unless you're self-sabotaging. If you're self-sabotaging and you know it, stop it. That's not going to help you. Okay, so just cut that bit out. So at that point in time, what do you do? You make a decision with the information you've got at that point in time. So we're coming here now. Do you know how much rain you're going to get and when? No. Is that going to change the, uh, whether your decisions are the right ones or potentially the ones that aren't quite as good for your business? Absolutely. So because we can't control that, all you can do is make decisions with what you have at hand now. Now, your decision might become a bad decision or a wrong decision, whatever word you want to put around that, in the future, isn't it? When you're looking back with this beautiful little thing, this benefit of hindsight, where all the unknowns become known. So that makes sense. When you make a decision, it shouldn't be wrong. It should be the best decision you can make at that point in time. It's only down the track you work out whether it was a good one or a wrong one. Okay? And then what do you do with that? Learn. Learn. You've all heard this before, but how often do you sit there and just be really honest? You've all heard that, haven't you? If you make a wrong decision, you've just got to get back on the bike and learn. Who's heard that before? Bullshit. More of you have heard it than that. <laughs> okay, you've all heard it. However, how many of you sit there and go indecisive, indecisive, and sit there and spin and spin and spin and spin? On one hand, you know you don't have all the information to make the right decision. And yet you sit there and churn energy, increase stress. That. How much pain do we actually put ourselves through? A bit too much, I think, and you've got enough stress to deal with. So let's see, you've got to focus on what can you do to minimise. That's all you can do. Because this is the outcome. And if you can read this up there, I found this the other day, I thought it was pretty good. Anxiety. 
And it is. The, the level of anxiety you have increases. With the more indecision, the level of anxiety increases. And you become like this poor old cuppy here that's trying to please everyone and just doing its head in. Yeah, yeah, okay, I only want a photo of that. Just Google it, mate. If, uh, if fight your own fights. Is there a reason that missed back up in Darwin and you're still down here? <laughs> and this is another outcome too that we see, isn't it? Okay? I used to be indecisive, now I'm not sure. And I just want you to really have a think about in your businesses, in your life, what the cost of not making decisions is. Indecision, in my opinion, costs the industry more than any change in market, than any change in season. It's the indecision. It's sitting back, waiting on your hands, waiting for things to improve. Okay? The things you can't control, sell. So I think confidence is a really important one, and it's just accepting the brutal reality of the environment in which you choose to do business. You've all chosen to be doing what you're doing. That's been your decision, your choice. So my encouragement to you would be to accept that brutal reality of that environment in which you've chosen to do business and think about how you can manage that in the best possible way. And how do you decrease that degree of indecision and wheel spinning which causes sleeplessness, increased stress, increased health issues, etc., etc., etc. doesn't mean that you can make everything easy. I'm not kidding myself about that for a minute. I'm not suggesting that it's easy. I'm just trying to encourage you, what can we do to make it a little bit less difficult at times? Part of that's going to come back to minimising procrastination. When we've been indecisive, we're procrastinating. So a couple of takeaways for you. If you probably know you should be doing something. Now, I haven't worked with anybody in Australian agriculture or internationally that isn't an incredibly brilliant person. All got so much knowledge and so much skills. You usually know what you need to do. You just may not be acknowledging it. You usually know what you need to do. Now, if you know you should be doing something and don't know how to do it, should do a feed budget, but I actually don't know how to do it. Really simple thing that maybe your next step might be. Go and bloody find out. Let's just follow this thought process through. If you know you need to do something and it's potentially going to be worth a million dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, whatever the size it is in your business, if you know you need to do it and it's going to cost you a lot if you don't do it, then go and find out how to do it. It might be worth it, wouldn't it? Unfortunately, uh, my observation with a lot of businesses, uh, and what's the date? Fourth. As of tomorrow, I've been doing this work with RCS for 12 years. So I've been really lucky to work with a lot of people uh, around Australia, South Africa, America. Whenever... No, I won't worry about that now. Sorry. Make a decision. I just did. Thank you for the prompt. <laughs> Next part of this. If you know you should do something but don't know what to do, go and get some help. You know? Again, stop sitting on your hands. I'm not saying what you're dealing with is easy. Please don't misconstrue what I'm saying around that. But if you don't, if you've got something to do, you don't know how to do it, you don't know what to do, go and seek some input from that. Now, whether that's or not, that's not a blatant plug for us. Yes, that's, you can, if you've got other people you work with, go and work with them, whoever it may be, but go and get some support. Because learning doesn't stop, does it? If you think that you've got nothing left to learn, guess what? You're in trouble. You're in trouble. You're you're dead. That's right. The only time you stop learning is when you die. Now, you've got a lot to learn. I think, we're, where are we? We're at the start of the year now. We're um, one month down, but we're in February. What is it that you want to learn this year? Have you actually consciously sat back and thought and set yourself a challenge? Come the end of 2019, what do I want to be better at? What's one part of my skill set that I would really love to be better at by the end of this year? What's one thing that I could focus on? How many of you have done that? A few of you? Well done. For the rest of you, maybe that might be worthwhile. What's something that if you were better at doing would decrease your stress and make you happier by the end of the year? Whatever that may be, go and find a way to do it. Get on Google. It's amazing how much you can learn from that. With all the different things, now you're juggling a huge amount of balls in the air. Think about the operations that you're running. You're sitting there, you're juggling, and you've got 13, 14, 15 balls that you're trying to juggle. That's the reality. When you want to learn something, let's say you've got to add another ball, do you reckon you should sell or buy? He can buy. Okay. Now, if you've got to go through and you're going to learn something, there's four stages that we go through when we're learning. 
The first stage on the left there is unconscious incompetence. Now, this is where you don't know what you don't know. Now, you're going to hear some topics and conversation things today. Uh, if you've never heard of a grazing chart before today, you're probably sitting there at the moment reeling, I don't know. I, I, before this morning, you didn't know that you didn't know what a grazing chart was. Now, if you know what a grazing chart is, then the next step is, and you don't know how to fill it in, then you move to conscious competence. I know these things exist, but I don't know how to fill them out. Okay? That's conscious incompetence. You, don't know, you, you, you know you don't know. The next one after that that you go into is conscious competence. This is where you know what you know, but you've got to stop and think about it. Now, I know how to fill in a grazing chart, but I've got to think and just step through the steps and think about where to put numbers and how to use them. And then once you've done that for long enough, you move to this stage of unconscious competence. You don't think about it anymore, you just do it. Hands up if you drove here this morning. Yep. Did you have to stop and think, okay, if you're in a manual car, left foot goes on the clutch, over to the left and up, and then slowly release the clutch and slowly put a bit of um, pressure on the separator? You didn't, did you? You just get in because you've gone to that stage now of unconscious competence in driving. You don't have to think about it. You just get in the car and go. With those skills, if, you, if something popped into your head before with that one thing that you want to be better at by the end of the year, then you've got to go through these stages. Okay? If you know that you don't know how to do a feed budget, it's going to take you a while to get to the point where you can walk out in the paddock and estimate feed. And the reason I'm mentioning this, I just want you to be, uh, accept the fact that there's going to be some grind. There's going to be some hard work. There's going to be some frustration. There's going to be some anxiety around it. And there's going to be some indecision. However, if you don't push through that, you're never going to increase your ability to implement that skill. Riding a bike, the old saying, if fall off, get back on, go again. If you didn't keep doing that, you never would have learned to ride a bike. It's pretty straightforward. You know this stuff, but I think when it comes to businesses and the fact that you sit there and you're juggling 13 bulls in the air and all of us are always dropping a couple, we've got to accept that it's a bit of a grind. There's a lot of work to work out how we stop dropping that bull. You thought you were coming here to hear about cattle, didn't you? We've, um, we've seen, all, those of you who have been through some of the programs with us, you'll notice that everything that we do works, on, works through those four stages of learning. So from seminars here to the grazing, and prof, grazing for Profit School, right through to Executive Link and Consulting. It's all about helping people to go through that. So acknowledge, you've got to put in the work. You're running multi-million dollar businesses, I'm afraid there's a bit of work that goes with that. If you don't want to make those decisions, then my opinion is really around that, that you shouldn't be in business because you're leaving your success up to chance. And hope is not a strategy. So decision-making. Both Peter, Cole, Stu have all talked about decision-making a bit this morning. It's a pretty important one, isn't it? The only difference between successful businesses and less successful businesses is the decisions they make and the circumstances they've got. You've all heard that. So now we need to make sure that we're accepting that and basing our decision-making around it. Unfortunately, this is one of our main strategies in agriculture with the things that we don't know how to deal with. Because if we don't know how to deal with it, we go and make ourselves really busy with the things that we are really good at doing and know how to do. Which means that the things that we don't know how to do don't get done when we need, in the way we need, which can have some repercussions down the track, unfortunately. Now, I want to put a bit of a disclaimer in. Wherever you're at at this point in time, we're going to start talking about some scenarios around drought management and things like that and some, some economics. Wherever you're at today, whatever's got you to this point in time, sitting here in this room, standing at the back, you cannot change anything that's got you here to this point. Everyone, can I just get a show of hands that you agree with that? Yeah. Everything that you've done to get you to this point in time, sitting here today, you can't actually change that. And there's a statement that I really love by this fellow called Robert Holden. He goes, sometimes for a better future, we need to give up all hope for a better past. <laughs> and I reckon we all know somebody who spends their time wishing that something that happened in the past didn't happen to them. And that's not really helping them right at that point in time. And the reason I say that is that I know, um, I drove down from Yapoon yesterday, I'm based up in Queensland. And uh, I drove through a lot of country that's in a lot of pain. And so therefore, there's going to be a lot of business, a lot of pain. And um, 
I don't know a lot of you and I don't know your businesses, you might be in a lot of pain at the moment. So wherever you're at today, I want you as much as you can to accept that, okay, we can't undo anything that's got you at this point. But I would like to think, okay, what can I do to control where I go from here? That's all you can do. Because I don't want you living in the past with it. A couple of sobering results. Some of you might have seen a couple of articles that have published recently around our benchmarking from last financial year. The unfortunate reality with it is that for the first time since RCS started benchmarking in the early 90s, the average return on assets was zero. So the average return on assets was actually zero, and that's not just drought-driven or seasonal-driven. Uh, there was a considerable correction in the cattle market through there. There was a slight correction in the sheep market. But at the same time, if we look at it across the historical period, the prices received, the average commodity prices received through this 2017-18 financial year was actually the highest that we've seen, if you look right across the board. Would everyone agree with that? You know, we've come, we're going through a pretty golden period still. A lot of pain, but we're still going through a pretty golden period. The top 20% are sitting at around 4.2% return on assets. Okay, and that's, uh, that's just from a production business point of view. That's not any revaluation of land or anything in that. Um, I've written a lot more about this. You can get off the website and these pictures and everything if you want. So don't worry about trying to remember them there. But let's think, the reason I put that up there is that we've got to make some decisions if we're going to make that different. If we just sit back and go, geez, I hope next year is better, then the probability of next year being better is going to be fairly low. So what do we need to do? You know, we've been working, and some of you have seen this, this analogy of a three-legged pot. Every operation that we deal with in agriculture is a three-legged pot. A lot of you are nodding going, here they go again with their bloody pot. <laughs> Three legs of the pot are made up of your land management. How good a job are we actually doing at managing our land? Second leg is our production systems. I'm assuming a lot of you are going to be cattle, probably cattle and sheep, and then a bit of cropping. So that is how good a job are we doing at managing the bits that we actually turn into money. Okay, sheep, cattle, crops. The third leg that supports this pot is how good a job we're doing with our business management. What's our financial literacy like? And then up in the pot is us, is the people. So every decision that you make, and Cole mentioned this there, uh, sorry, Peter mentioned this there this morning, uh, you've got every, in, every decision you make is going to have some impact on your people, your land, your livestock and your business. You can't ignore that. And each of those being strong, so you want these three legs of the pot to be equal length and strong, otherwise the three-legged pot falls over and people fall out and we have trouble keeping people in agriculture. Not that that's common, is it? What else do we need for good decisions? So up here, usually most people want some degree of life improvement and business improvement. Would you agree with that? Yeah, we want a bit more holidays or a bit more family time, a bit less stress, and we probably want a bit more profitability, you know, a bit less financial stress in the business as well. Down the bottom, we've got these production systems. How do we link them together? Now, I want you to just uh, wrap your head around this model here quickly, this diagram. The first thing you've got is data. You've got some land data, some cattle numbers, there's data from that, and you've got some financial data, might be the information coming from your accountant. That's all just data. Data by itself is a complete and utter waste of time. Okay? Data by itself is a complete and utter waste of time unless you turn it into some meaningful information, something that you can actually digest and make sense of. And on that, how many people reckon they're a bit time poor? Good. Those of you who don't have your hands up, the person sitting next to you wants you to tell you how you're not. You know, or you're delusional. I don't know which one it is yet. Okay. Most of us are time poor. So we need to think about how much time are you spending keeping data that not, you're not using to make decisions. If you're spending lots of time recording data that you're not using to make decisions, isn't that a waste of time? Pretty common in ag. I see that a hell of a lot. Over there, we've also got people. Now, the people in the business help us determine our goals and our direction. Where are we going? What are we actually trying to achieve? What's important? That's the, up to the people. That's up to the owners and the people working in the business. That's not for anyone external to determine. That's all you need to make decisions. If you want to sit down and make a professional decision, you've got to have some meaningful information, you need to know where you're going. What's the outcome that you want? And I encourage you to probably think about that next time you sit down to make a decision. Right, oh, we need to work out what we're going to do with this. Right. Well, do we know what outcome we want? Do we know what we're trying to achieve? If not, you better have a discussion around that because otherwise, how do you know what's the right decision or not? And right, what have we got to base this on? Do we have any meaningful information from our data that we can use to help us? And if you don't, maybe you need to go and try and get some of that before you can sit down and actually make that decision. Two really key factors 
that in my experience, we see a lot of businesses trying to sit down, trying to make a decisions without any acknowledgement of some meaningful information and actually, what are we trying to achieve? That makes sense? Then we can be professional. To me, that's when we're being a professional management. Is that easy? No, <laughs> unfortunately. Nothing is. There's no silver bullet. So next time you're opening up the newspaper and you get a silver bullet being advertised for you, ignore it. We're going to stop. We're going to get rid of that bloody noise. Okay? You're getting sold silver bullets every time you open a newspaper, watch a TV ad, and something pops up in your phone. Just bloody ignore it. It's a waste of time. It's a distraction that you don't have time for. So ignore that and start thinking about what can you do. It takes time. You've got to get some knowledge to do this. The hard part after knowledge is actually turning this into skills. Having somebody going and doing a course and having somebody tell you how to do a budget or somebody telling you how to do a feed budget or do a gross margin is one thing. Knowing how to actually go back in your business and do it, that's the hard part, isn't it? That's when you've got to put your shoulder to the wheel. And that's where, again, I talked about this morning, that's where you've got to have that grind. That's where you've got to almost get excited to be uncomfortable because you know on the other side of discomfort, there's actually usually a breakthrough. Unfortunately now, my opinion is, society's bloody scared of discomfort. We don't want to go through that bit of pain to get to the point to actually know how to do it. We'll go and distract ourselves with something that's more exciting. And if we think we're immune to that in agriculture, we're kidding ourselves. So if we just want to break this out for a minute now. Three-legged pot. And let's just look at this in a really simple way for a second. One of the goals that we've got with managing our land is to increase our carrying capacity to be able to run more animals on the same parcel of land. That would be a good outcome, do you think? Yeah. So if we are doing what we can, and there's different things we can do around that, to increase our carrying capacity, the next step from that then is to match our stocking rate to our carrying capacity. Happy with that? I don't. So let's think about that for a second. Once we've done that, if we've matched our stocking rate to carrying capacity, what we want to be doing then is running enterprises that suit you and your landscape, not an enterprise that suits your neighbour. So Stu talked about um, trading here this morning. If trading does your head in, maybe trading isn't the right enterprise for you. So it's not about doing what somebody else has said is right. It's about doing what works for you on your landscape. Okay? Don't, uh, don't try and follow the mob. Don't be a lemming. So you've got to run enterprises with the highest gross margin per DSE. It basically tells you what you're getting paid for your grass. That's why it's such a powerful number is knowing your gross margin per DSC. If you do that, if you increase your carrying capacity as much as you can, match stocking rate to carrying capacity, you stock it with the enterprises that are going to pay you the most amount of money for your feed in the current market conditions, and you do that at the optimal level of overheads, that's not starving a profit into your business either. That's just about optimal overheads with the best, inter <coughs> excuse me, best interest rates you can get in the market. That's going to go a long way towards businesses being as viable and profitable as they can. Now, I use this doing a lot of consulting work with people and draw this diagram out and I say, so how are you going in these areas? And even fellas that I work with every year, oh, yeah, I probably need to work on this one. I'm not doing this one quite well. And I reckon every single one of you in this room that's running an agricultural business could look at one of those areas there and go, yep, that's probably an area I could focus on and be better at this year. doesn't mean you're not good but it means that that's, that that's your next opportunity to be better. And don't forget this bit too. Communicate internally with the people in your business and communicate externally with the people involved in your business, your stakeholders that aren't there. Now, the next key part, isn't it? So maybe take a moment and have a look and go, yeah, right, which one of those could I probably be better at? If you're looking at one of those going, oh, I've got no bloody idea what this fella's talking about, maybe that's your focus area. Because in my opinion, and I'm really fortunate to look at a lot of businesses, the most successful businesses, the happiest businesses, the ones that are most likely to be here in another 700 years' time are the ones that are nailing this stuff. And they're not leaving it up to chance. <laughs> right, those on that side, you've got to look over here. So let's talk about this one over this uh, left-hand leg here from it on land and uh, stocking rate to carrying capacity. It's all about turnover. Now let's just make sure that we're talking about the same thing for a second. What is carrying capacity? I reckon... Excuse me. Different I'll ask you a question. Is matching stocking rate to carrying capacity important? Critical. Thank you. I agree with that. 
Now, it's, it's, it is critical importance to us. How good are we at doing that in agriculture? Not great. It's probably an area that we could improve in. I reckon one of the reasons why we may not get it as well as we would like is because we don't actually understand the difference between the two. I find it really disturbing in some ways the amount of articles I'll read by um, advisors and educators who interchange the term stocking rate and carrying capacity. If you're interchanging these two terms, it's small bloody wonder we can't get it right. What is carrying capacity? Carrying capacity is what grows up from below in response to moisture, temperature. So it's, a, it's actually the amount of tucker that your country produces. Well, that might be fodder crops or grass or pastures, whatever you're doing. But anyhow, that's what comes up from below. Stocking rate is what we put down from above. One comes up, one comes down. Our job, as much as we can, is to try and get them as close as possible. Are you going to get it exactly the same? No. That's near on impossible. It's about trying to move with the trend and move with the seasons as best you can. We don't want to be in the situation on that left-hand one there where we are understocked. We've got a heap of feed we're not using. And we don't want to be in the situation on the right-hand side where we are overstocked. We're trying to eat more than we have. We'll come back to that a little bit more in a second. If we look at this, I found this and I'll sort of throw it in. You might have been getting sick of the serious stuff by now. So if you're looking for a conversation starter next time you're at the pub, barbecue, instead of talking about the rain, here's something for you. Tell them that you're a pluviophile. <laughs> don't worry, two days ago I didn't think I was going to be saying that. So I don't blame you if you didn't expect to be hearing that. And then try and talk your way out of where their head went. Because <laughs> they're going to be making some pretty big assumptions pretty quick around that. Okay, so please, if you can't read that, a lover of rain, someone who finds joy and peace of mind during rain days, and I saw that pop up and I go, hey, <laughs> that's us. So there you go, there's your comedic interjection. Let's talk rainfall. Now, if we're matching stocking rate to current capacity, a really important part of this is that where you think about the impact of rainfall. Okay. Does rainfall received have any impact on your current capacity? It does, doesn't it? Yep, there's a really strong correlation between the two. Now this is, I grabbed some Tamworth rainfall data back to the early 90s. And this is your calendar year rainfall. So the blue bars are your different calendar years and then the, the line going across the middle, that's your average rainfall. Okay, that's your average. So you've all seen these things before. What's it doing? What are the blue bars doing? Going up, going down. Yep, and we're just going through a period there now where last year's calendar year was pretty low. I suggest we need to forget about calendar year rainfall. If there's one thing I could beg and plead with you to do is forget about calendar year rainfall because all it is is pub talk. It's really only useful for January. But what you had for January to December last year is actually irrelevant to you now. Average rainfall is, in my opinion, a unicorn. It does not exist. Average rainfall is something that's made up of lots of variations above and high. It's the high rainfall years and the low rainfall years. And the reason I mention this, one of the things that I want to achieve in my professional career is shifting this mindset in agriculture away from if we can just get a few normal years, normal means average, if we can just get a few average years, we'll get back on our feet again. The reason why I'm really passionate about this, uh, my background is a, um, a sheep and cattle property in the Mulga country south of Mitchell in southwest Queensland. So um, we get drought there. <laughs> we, get, uh, we get a fair few of them. And to spend more time than I can want to remember sitting on a dozer pulling mulga. And so I see the pain that goes through my family. They're still out there. I see the pain that goes through some clients. And a lot of it links back to this um, mentality of average rainfall. And I just want you to challenge yourselves here moving forward. Is that if your business, and your business is determined by the decisions you make, if your business is structured to only be profitable in an average rainfall year, you're actually setting yourself up to fail because an average rainfall year doesn't exist. Average rainfall is what you get as you're going through dry periods going back up to periods of high rainfall. And you get, might get an average rainfall again as you're coming back down going into that next drought. And that's the unfortunate, brutal, brutal reality behind what it is that you're managing. And I think in agriculture, if we can accept that and start asking ourselves the question, okay, how do I manage variability then that's a really nice question. And the answers that can come out of that 
can put you in a much better position. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy to answer. Doesn't mean that you'll be able to go through agriculture pain-free and no stress. I'm not delusional about that. But it's about accepting the brutal reality. So if we're going to forget about this whole unicorn thing, that'd be good. What I encourage you to, Stu mentioned this before, is move away from calendar rainfall analysis to rolling 12 months. How much rain have I had in the last 12 months at the end of every month? Not enough. <laughs> and it's important to know that. And I've gone through and I, uh, I've gone through and graphed this for my parents' property. I've got rainfall records back into the um, early 50s. And on a calendar year, the years they've done all right. Everything looks okay. When you look at an enrolling rainfall, there's plenty of years there that I've dropped down to. All I've had in the last 12 months is four inches of rain, 100 mils. Calendar year rainfall is 250. So if you look at calendar year rainfall, you go, geez, I should still be doing all right, shouldn't I? I had bloody 250 mil. But there was a period of time in there where they actually got down to 100 mils. How much can you do in 100 mil of rain in 12 months? Four fifths of five eighths of not a lot. Okay, it really drops out. So that's where rolling rainfall is a really good thing to look at. Now, um, you can do this yourself in a piece of paper. You can do it in my, you can do it at the bottom of your grazing chart. You can do this in any place. But start recording that. Now, looking at this Tamworth rainfall, actually, I'll go back to that for a second. Just look at the variability that you've got there. That's your reality. Now, the rolling rainfall at the moment is back in the 300s there around Tamworth. Is that the only time it's been there? No? Do you think it's the only time it'll ever be there? No. So if we accept that as reality and think, okay, how do I make it less painful next time? How do I make it less painful next time? How do I do this better? If you're coming through a horrific drought at the moment and um, not really happy with where you're at, one of the best questions you can ask yourself is, how do I make this less painful next time? And learn from this as much as you can. When I break it up and look at the number of months where you're rolling rainfall in the total, you actually only spend, that says 26% in the middle there, you only spend 26% of your total years between six and 700 mils. So one in four years is actually going to be in that period there. Not much of your time, is it? You actually spend 33% of your time in the 200, in the four, yeah, 200 mils below that, from the, uh, what's that, the four to 600 mil bracket. So you spend more time way down there than you do on this unicorn rainfall figure. So stop chasing the unicorn. And you spend about 25% above, which is nice. The opportunity that comes if you think about variability as being the norm, one of the questions we can start to ask ourselves is how do I make hay while the sun shines? How do I get extra profit out of my business in those good years to build up some buffers for the bad years that I know are going to come? To absorb the way through it. I had this conversation a lot with some clients last year. And I find that really rewarding and I got... James Barnett, who's our um, southern manager based out of Orange now here, and Raymond Stacey's here, and Nick Walker here from the RCS team as well. And I think that's probably one of the most rewarding things that we can hear. James, would you agree with that? I could have been in drought if I wanted. What does that mean? Didn't Sorry? Didn't play. didn't play? We play by a different set of rules. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it means that, okay, did we get the rainfall we may have liked? No. However, they managed to be in a better position where they actually weren't in drought. Because when it comes to drought, you know, Stu mentioned this before, right? we're either in a drought, we're managing during a drought, or we're recovering from the last one. They're the three stages of drought. Now, though, if you've done a seven-day school with us, put your hand up. Okay? Everyone who's done a seven-day grazing for profit school with us, go back, pick up your manual, go back and open it up, and at the end of the school, we got you to do your drought management plan where you went through and you came up with management strategies on how to drought-proof your properties for people, land, livestock and business. And then you came up with recovery strategies on how to recover your people, your land, your livestock and your business. And then you came up with how to um, manage during a drought, how to best manage your people, your land, live, land and livestock and business. You came up with a drought management plan, I'm just reminding you because you might have forgotten, and you put that right at the front of your manual when you finished the school. So if you're in a bit of pain now, maybe go and pull that up and have a look and say, maybe there's some prompts there that could help. You know, when it comes to drought management planning, it's accepting these three stages. I did a quick scenario, and I'll just run through this quickly before um, 
Dave cracks me off here. If we looked at your DSC carrying capacity, the red line in the background assumes that you get unicorn rainfall, which doesn't exist, does it? So that would be your carrying capacity if you had unicorn rainfall every year. That's the number of animals you could potentially run. The green line in front is an indication of what your potential actual carrying capacity could have been. This is off the Tamworth rainfall data. If you adjusted for actual rainfall received. Bit of variability there, isn't there? Now, the gaps there that you can see with the red, if you're trying to stock at the top of the red there, unfortunately, you've got to make up that feed gap with money in different forms. So if you're going to make that up. What I found interesting is I actually put the Eastern Young Cattle Indicator over this as well, which is that black line. The outcome from that that I'll tell you is there's absolutely not a lot of correlation between it. So therefore, let's think about this. Price received has a big impact on profitability, yeah? Now, I think with the widespread poor seasons, we did see a decline in the Eki uh, when we came off that peak there. However, it came back to a low point which was highest than any high point we'd seen in any time in the beef industry before. I think it's important for us to remember this. Our cattle prices, relative terms, are still pretty good. Now, that means that, okay, the cattle market wasn't completely dependent on seasons. Okay, we've got, we've seasons change, so it's not completely dependent. So what determines our price received then? What can we control? Do you think the quality of the article you're trying to sell? Has any of them? Yeah. The condition of your animals? Yeah. So if you've got an animal that's Ford store, are you going to get more per kilo for an animal that's Ford store than an animal that's um, animal welfare potential issue hopping on a truck? What determines whether you've got an animal that's poor or Ford store? Man, I'll tuck you give it. Matching stocking rate to carrying capacity when the circle comes around, doesn't it? So let's think if we can't, you know, we sit there and go, oh, I'm not going to get paid anything for them. No, you're not going to get paid anything for them now, which means there was a series of decisions that we may have been able to make better leading up to that. And I acknowledge, lot of, if you're in that position now, I'm, I'm not trying to make this difficult for you now. It's about what can you do? I want you to really try and look at what you can take control of and what you can learn for next time. Now, I'm going to tell you a quick tale of two businesses. 500 head cow operation, cow-calf operation, Tamworth. Producer A, they sold 180 PDIC cows in early 2018 because they looked at their rolling rainfall and feed budget and said, no, I don't have the feed, so they sold 180 head. Uh, and they, as a result, they didn't need to feed. And then they did an early weaning because they didn't get the autumn that they would have liked. And they did an early weaning of 288 head in November and sold everything. And compare that to producer B. Hold on to the 500 head cows because that's what we need to run. And fed to feel the feed gap. And I just worked on hay at 300 bucks a tonne. Weaned earlier than normal. So they still did a bit of an early weaning. Uh, 450 head and sold all of them. And I've tried to keep this as fair and equal as I can. And it's just a model. If you're not aware of the DSE rating changes from weaning, that might be a good thing to talk about after. Early weaning is one of the biggest levers you've got in dry seasons. And I still think it's probably one of the most underappreciated, the power of doing an early wean in dropping your stocking rate. And um, our next newsletter is going to have a lot more information on that in the article I'm doing. So you can see there the difference in the DSE rating from doing an early weaning versus not. And this is the difference in the DSE on farm. Total DSE... So the top line is the business who kept 500 head, 500 cows, and didn't early wean, versus the total DSE for the one that only sold 180 head and didn't early wean. There's a huge chasm between the two, isn't there? It's the power of an early wean and an early adjustment, so making a decision early. That's the cash balance after 12 months from the business that sold early versus the one that fed and went through. Now, the one that fed got a lot more weaners. However, the price had also declined. There's a $260,000 difference on a 500 head operation in 12 months. And I was very kind to the producer B operation there, as there could be. The outcome from that is that producer A could actually go back to the market now, today, and pay $1,500 for a breeder again. What type of a breeder could you buy in today's market for $1,500? Sorry? Stud. 
you can buy some really good quality animals. And I, the reason I mention that is that a really common thing that I hear is, oh yeah, but if I sell mine, I'm going to go back and buy somebody else's rubbish. Not always the case. You, know, you can set yourself up to actually expose yourself to buy really good quality animals. So 1500 bucks, and that's been in exactly the same financial position. What's not taken into account there is the cost on the land. That early wean, when I just went and played with some numbers this morning, a business that early weans, their feed demand from their breeders is 26% lower. That's like having 26% less animals compared to the animal that doesn't early wean. I know Kit's going to talk about that more this half. And I just want you to consider this. The position of power always lies with the person who has grass. So how do you measure that? Grazing charts and my grazing, some of the tools. You know, if you've done anything with us, you know you hear us rabbit on about grazing charts. And you hear us rabbit out on earth grazing charts and rabbit on rabbit on. The reason why is because they're probably the most powerful decision-making tool that you've got access to. I look at every business, I think, that is in control of variable rainfall and they fill in a grazing chart and they use it as a decision tool. That's not a coincidence. There is an amazing decision-making tool that can reduce your st stress levels at your fingertips if you choose to use it. Now, they're worth... James would have some more recent figures from down here than me. I know some of the businesses in Queensland last year that I worked with and some guys from South Australia were talking differences between fifty dollars and $400,000 in terms of the value of the decisions they made by having access to this. So it's not insignificant. To me, that's worth a bit of pain to work out how to fill the bloody things in. Just really quickly on this gross margin stuff. Know your gross margin per DSE, I beg and plead. I reckon it's one of the most powerful numbers. There's a lot of numbers I think are pretty powerful, and that's one of them. Know your overheads. I just want to put this figure up. So I'm getting cracked off. Your overheads per DSE, this is actual data out of our benchmarking work that we've been doing. This is the overhead cost per DSE. So basically, if you look at your total overhead costs and distribute across the number of DSE that you've actually run, that's one of the most alarming trends I'm seeing coming out of our benchmarking. Now, is it easy to manage? No. So you've gone from being in about that $8 DSE mark to now operating up closer to $15 to $20 per DSE in overheads. If you don't have strategies in place to combat that, it's going to bite you because that is an input cost that's just going up regardless of what you do. So my encouragement there is get some strategies around it. Put some thought into it. It's coming. Expense ratio, cost production. Final thought on this. Those of you in the beef industry, we've gone through a period of 15 years where the variation in the beef industry was probably only around about 100 cents a kilo. And a lot of people that I work with now, I reckon their formative years in decision making was through a relatively stable cattle market period. There actually wasn't a huge variation. The rules of the game have changed now. The new norm at the moment is variability and extreme variability. When I ran the benchmarks in November last year, we'd seen 100 cents a kilo variation in the last three months. So it's jumping around. The, and is that easy to manage? No, it's not. I think we've got to have a very different viewpoint about how we go about running our businesses to mitigate that and um, limit the downside of risk in your business. Because if you go out and you buy animals and you get a 100% correction before you go to sell them, you've got to put on a bucket load of kilos to make up for that capital loss unless you've got good strategies in place to manage that. So what's your strategy? We went through these. I want to just finish with this. Prices are going to vary, except it as being normal. <laughs> Seasons are going to vary. Forget about unicorns. Right? All we can do is be the most professional manager we can along the way to come out of it in the best position, the best shape that we can.